Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, this is a Game of Thrones, uh, Fire and Blood, A Song of Ice and Fire Q&A session. It's just me today, uh, so hopefully we'll get a chance to get through a whole load of questions. It's going to be the same sort of format that we normally do. Uh, there are uh, a whole load of questions I've got through from my patrons that I want to be working my way through. Obviously, if there are any super chats, we'll get to them straight away. And I hope I can get to as many of the questions uh, just in the chat, just going through. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to go through these uh, hopefully quite quickly. But uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, just drop them in there. I Incidentally, I saw, um, if you're watching live, a couple of people in the chat for the first time today, uh, a particular welcome to you. Um, so we're going to dot around a bit with these questions. I think uh, we've got uh, a few which are talking about uh, Fire and Blood itself and the details of that. A couple which talk about the last video that I've done and quite a lot that are just moving about all over the place in Game of Thrones. So uh, let's go straight in with a couple which are to do with John and John's name uh, in the in on the show, uh, which he was revealed as being Aegon. So I had a question from one of my patrons, uh, Billy, saying I've heard many times the relevance of John's name being Aegon after the Conqueror. Uh, however, we find in Fire and Blood that there were many named Aegon, um, and people assume it means that John will parallel Aegon the first, but there were a few weak King Aegons too. And then anime lover Nicole, who I certainly I saw there in the chat as well, saying, uh, "What do you think John's name will be in the books?" I personally don't think it's Aegon because Rhaegar already had a son named like that. I like the name Jaehaerys. So. This is uh, a great subject to, to be getting into. I did a video on this, I think, about 18 months ago, uh, which was just after the last season, just after the big reveal of John's name. And I think the key to understanding what this is is to try and get into the mindset of who was naming baby John and what were the circumstances at the time. Now, what uh, the situation was that we know that Rhaegar was naming his children after the three original Targaryens. So he'd already got Aegon, he'd already got Aranis, and so the very clear assumption is that he was expecting his third child to be a girl that he could call Visenya. So that was what he was going in there thinking, wanting, and expecting. And because he was such a strong believer in prophecy, I think that it, the thought did not cross his mind that it wasn't going to be a girl that he could name Visenya. But he wasn't there for the birth. He left a few months before, headed up to go and join uh, the, the, the battle there to take the Targaryen forces uh, in what turned out to be the Battle of the Trident, and obviously he died there. John was born somewhere around about that period when he died, or just a little bit after that. Now, so what's happened is that we've got Lyanna on her own, effectively, having to decide on the baby's name. And the only thing that uh, she would have been told by Rhaegar is, it's going to be a girl, and I want to call it Visenya. She, however, suddenly realises, A, it's not a girl, and uh, B, Rhaegar is now dead, and she may well also, depending on the exact timing, she may well know that his first children are dead. So I think that this immediately makes us think, well, what is she going to name this child? This, is, this child is the heir to the throne, uh, and therefore a Targaryen. Um, it obviously going to be a little bit more complicated in the books whether or not they're actually married uh, but that's the next video in my kind of Robert's Rebellion series is going to cover that very issue of whether they actually were married but I think she will want to have named this child some way to honor the the dead uh, the, the 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 man that she loved the the, the children that were lost. So that opens up a whole range of possibilities. I think Aegon is indeed a possibility that she might have named uh, her child after the baby Aegon who died. I think there's a, a slightly mind-blowing possibility she could even have named the baby Rhaegar. Or, intriguingly, if you've got Visenya, the male form of that could well be something like Viserys. 
So we've got a few different names going on there. I think it's quite clear to me that it doesn't have to be Aegon. It it could be um, uh, any one of a number of different names. I think that the show have done Aegon because they've, to a degree, conflated Jon's character with the character of Aegon Fagon that we have in the books. So I think that's what was going on there. I also like the idea that he might be a Jaehaerys. I think that works quite well for me in terms of his character as this kind of conciliator figure. But it could have been, it could be any of those names. And I think that it actually doesn't make huge amounts of difference because Danny is taking on the role of being the Aegon, the conqueror, the dragon rider coming in to, um, in her mind, claim the Iron Throne, which obviously was forged in the first place by Aegon. So John does not have that role in the books. That is Danny's role in the books. Um, as a slight uh, sort of second bit to that, Billy, you're talking about whether or not it would make sense for John and Danny to marry, because obviously a lot of the uh, the older Targaryens, they would, um, and the newer Targaryens, they would marry their siblings. Um, yeah, I don't think this would be a stumbling block for her at all. We read in the books that as she was growing up, she just assumed she would be marrying her brother, Viserys. She just, that was just what she thought w would happen. So if she suddenly discovers that she has got um, another relative, it would actually be one of the first thoughts in her mind whether or not she should marry them. It, the stumbling block for that would be John, not her. So, uh, yes, it's entirely possible she might think that, uh, but probably he would not. Okay, so uh, I hope that answered those ones uh, for you there. Um, second question, Brian Price. Uh, hi, Brian, uh, saying, can you speculate what will happen during or after the Battle of Winterfell? Will the Night King win? Will he go down into the crypts and do something magical? So this is a show question. Um, so the, oh, I assume it's a show question. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit for the, the books as well. So on the show, I am pretty sure that what's going to happen is that the Night King will probably sweep through the... The, the, the few bits of the north that we don't get huge amounts about i could i think that castle black will go um i think that the uh, the the northern um settlements that we sort of uh, vaguely hear about like the last hearth we will probably just vaguely hear about again on the show as having been overrun i think that they will make winterfell quite a big set piece because obviously this has been such a staple part of the show all the way through but in terms of him going down to the crypts and doing something magical on the show i don't think he will i think that he will uh, destroy or take over winterfell i think that he will push further south than that but i don't think that they've built up the actual magical elements of what's going on in the crypts on the show in the same way that they have in the books. Now, in the books, uh, those of you who've been watching my videos for a while will know that I, I have a feeling that the Stark dead will rise. I think that that is the whole point of why we've had these crypts under Winterfell. Why they've uh, been the Starks always had to remain there, so that the Starks would always be buried there. I think that they will. There will be magic, and so we will get this um, battle of the Stark dead against the army of the dead so i think that that's what's going to be happening there and indeed i think that he might well be wanting to go down to there to try and dispel this as it were i think that winterfell is definitely tapped into this same weirwood network so i think that he will be wanting to be getting rid of that in the same way that he would he was wanting to with the three-eyed raven's cave that we saw um in the show so uh, that's what I think is going to be uh, going on there, Brian. Um, Catherine Yoda uh, asks, uh, and this is about the letter. Um, the last video I did was about fire and blood. It's not just a fire and blood incident. It was also in the world of ice and fire. And it's about the situation that happened after the conquest. And we had 
uh, dawn resisting. They uh, the the Targaryens would come and they would attack, and the dawn uh, would. Uh, resist. First of all, they would disappear out into the desert, um, uh, hide away, and then the moment that the Targaryens turned their backs, the Dornish would kind of rise up and they would kill everybody in sight. And they could not be overrun, and they refused to bend the knee. Now, the end to that first Dornish war was when there was this letter mysterious letter which went to King Aegon. Now what we uh, what we read about is that there was a change of leadership in Dawn. We had um, the Yellow Toad was her sort of nickname. Um, Maria Martell died and then Nymor Martell, her son, took over. And he sent a letter with his daughter that was just for Aegon's eyes only. And Aegon read it. He clearly got quite angry. He gripped the Iron Throne uh, till blood was running from his hand. Uh, he got onto Beleriand. He flew up to Dragonstone. He flew back the next morning. And then he accepted the peace terms. Now, the question is, what was in the letter? Because... We don't know. He burned it and he refused to talk to anyone about it. Now, my video set out the case that there are some things here that we know or we can try and draw some conclusions from. First of all, it seemed to make him angry. It seemed to make Aegon angry, but not it would appear at Nymor Martell um, or indeed uh, Daria Martell, his daughter, who were there. So he didn't he didn't take out his anger on them. Whatever it was prompted him to go to Dragonstone, and it was only on return from Dragonstone that he accepted peace. So trying to take all of these bits together, I came up with a, a theory. I, it is just a theory. We, we do not know this, that the thing that was in the letter was information about what happened to Rhaenys, who died uh, in one of these attacks on on Dawn. She died uh, on her dragon, Maraxis. Maraxis was shot by a scorpion bolt in the eye. Maraxis fell down, and um, there were rumours that Rhaenys survived and was was tortured by the others who were there. Uh, that was the family who lived at the Hellholt, which was where she was. Um, and then the kind of the stories fizzle out. So my theory was that, yes, that did actually happen. And then Nymor Martell uh, decided he wanted peace. And so he was going to tell Aegon what had happened, be open and upfront, say he hadn't agreed with it, or he'd only just discovered about this. And he wanted to return Rhaenys' body so that uh, Aegon could uh, put her to rest, could uh, cremate her in the, the Targaryen way. And he'd offered to take the body up to um, Dragonstone. And so that was why Aegon was angry to start with, because he was reading about these things that had happened. But he wasn't angry with Nymor. And that's why he went to Dragonstone, and having confirmed everything, he then came back. So that was my sort of working theory. And I should just say on all of these things, when I say it's a theory, what I mean is just like a working hypothesis. It's the best thing that fits the facts that I have found so far. Now, uh, Catherine Yoda's question was, perhaps that letter was written by Rhaenys herself, describing some specific item or place on Dragonstone, which Aegon then went to verify, content unknowable. I think that's possible. I think the idea that Rhaenys was still alive in some way, or perhaps wrote the letter in some way, I, I, I kind of like as well, because it's um, if there is one person who could have persuaded Aegon to accept peace, it would have been her. 
and uh, we know that he loved her hugely and we know that she was also not a warlike person she loved the fun things of life like musicians and flying and and, and jesters and things like that she was she seemed very vibrant um uh, happy kind of character as opposed to someone like Visenya who seemed quite warlike so uh, yes perhaps it could have been something written by her personally now um I got uh, da, 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 quickly flick down Klaus. Thank you so much. Um, you left uh, a few questions about this, um, which I'll happily just quickly go through here. So with this theory, um, you were asking, was the yellow toad aware? Would she have been aware of this, uh, this torture going on? Yes, I think she probably was. She was completely uncompromising and so i think that, that she was probably very aware of it and quite happy with it that the the dornish had competitions and uh, about who could torture their prisoners for longest um before they died so i think that given that that was known i suspect that the yellow the yellow toad uh, maria martel might well have been aware how did nymore find out well, I don't know. He might have known before. He might have known during that time, but not been able to do anything about it because he wasn't in charge. Or maybe he was told when he became in charge. Um, I, that the the timing of him finding out, I don't think is uh, is huge. You suggest that whether yeah, how could he really count on Aegon not blaming him for the death of Rhaenys? I think this is a really important point. The letter we often treat this letter as being this was the plan. This was the Martell's plan to get peace. It wasn't. This was a backup plan. This was the um, the reserve plan. So what we find is that we get um, we get the, the, the envoy going over there, his daughter going there. She's bringing back Maraxis's skull. This was like the first uh, peace offering to say, here, we're returning this skull to you and suggesting peace. And then there was what appears to have been a long period of time when Aegon, Aegon actually wanted peace himself, but Visenya was really angry, uh, particularly when seeing the dragon skull, demanding that they go and uh, just carry on with the war with Dawn. Uh, his advisors, he sent out ravens and got advice from all over the place. They were also advising that he doesn't accept peace it was only after all of that, this was some days or possibly even weeks, only after all of that, when uh, Aegon was back in open court and he was about to officially reject the offer, it was only then that she produced the letter. That tells me that this was a backup plan. This was something that she was told, okay, this is a bit of a gamble. If the if the original approach doesn't work, now try this. So if the question is, um, uh, how could he count, how could he be sure that Aegon would actually go with it, then I don't think he could. I think this was a, a, a desperate roll of the dice, uh, just to trying it. The, hey it might work it might not um was it dangerous sending his own daughter absolutely um then the the idea about uh, how that might have worked with like getting a body up to dragonstone personally i think this is one of those things where logistics could have been worked out i could certainly see a letter could have said go to Dragonstone, light a fire at the top, and we'll know that you're there and you agree to this. We've got a ship somewhere nearby that will then come in and sail and give you the body. Uh, so that that kind of thing, I think, could have been worked out. They didn't just sort of drop off the body and then wait to see whether or not Aegon was was willing for uh, willing to go for it or not. I think that they, they could have planned this one. Um, and then uh, why didn't Aegon tell Visenya? Because he saw how Visenya reacted to Maraxis's skull, to the dragon skull, and her reaction was anger and wanting to carry on the war. So he knew if if she found out what had happened to Rhaenys, she would just never want to end the war. So he didn't want to tell her about it. And then would he not have been angry with the others, the people who were doing this? I think he would. 
but at the same time, um, he'd already done his retribution. He went with Beleriand, the Black Dread, and uh, burned it down uh, a couple of times. And, and it's, it was so... Uh, the, the dragon fire was so heated that it turned some of the sand to glass, was what we, we hear. He, he vented his anger. He did that already. So that was actually something that already happened. Now... Um, you also had um, uh, a sort of separate question on, on that, or separate suggestion, I think. Uh, so uh, Evan Martel, um, uh, who is there in the chat today, hello, uh, good to see you. I think it's your first time in the chat, did suggest, and I'm not going to go through the whole uh, thing now, uh, Evan, I think I will... Uh, email you uh, or message you properly over on Patreon uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, but so the suggestion that perhaps she was still alive, and I think that this uh, this is a, a fascinating idea that perhaps she was still alive and wanted to stay hidden in Dawn because she uh, fell in love, because she had a baby there, any one of a number of different reasons. Now, I like this. Uh, I like this as an idea that perhaps she she was still alive. I personally do not think that um, Aegon would have just let the love of his life go that easily. If he suddenly found this person I thought was dead for years is actually suddenly still alive, I think that he would have done something about that. He would have tried to track her down, tried to find her. Yes, perhaps she was the person, the thing that went to Dragonstone, but would he have just had uh, one evening of chatting to her and then she said, well, that's it, I'm never going to see you again and go, would he have returned and been so magnanimous and peace-loving? I'm personally not so sure. But um, uh, I like the idea that she might have survived for a while and I also like the idea that she might have written the letter or at least written something within the letter persuading Aegon uh to be more peaceful um so uh that i think's worked through that if you've not incidentally if you've not seen that video then it's the last one i did before this live stream so please go back and check that it was called something like what was in the letter to aegon um just have a quick chat uh check through in the chats just to see um uh if there's any sort of questions in the um do, 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 do. can't see that uh so talking about uh tower of joy yes people are um uh asking have been asking for a while when i'm going to finish my series of videos about robert's rebellion leading up to the tower of joy now i uh, i have not forgotten that obviously Fire and Blood's come along, and so I've, I've been doing a few videos on Fire and Blood. The the next but one video I'm going to be doing, my next video I'll be doing, uh, is going to be talking about Area Targaryen and Beleriand uh, and what happened there. If you've read Fire and Blood, you'll know this is, uh, this is the fireworms thing. So that's going to be my take on what happened there. Uh, but after that, I'm going to come back to this, uh, finish off the series about uh, Robert's Rebellion and the Tower of Joy. I'm going to do one about whether or not um, Rhaegar and Lyanna were actually married. I want to do another one about what on earth they were up to during all of that time, because there's a huge period. Of, you know, they've got a year, 18 months or so, when uh, were they really just sat there in the Tower of Joy, um, just for all of that time, just hanging around, or was there something else going on? Why were they at the Tower of Joy in the first place? There's a lot of really interesting questions there, um, and in, in particular, the, the idea of, yeah, why why there? It's Yes, it was slightly hidden away, but actually, if you look at it, it's on the Prince's Pass, which is like the main thoroughfare into Dawn, so it wasn't that hidden away. So why there? What was going on? And I think that that teases out quite a few of the answers to what the bigger idea that was going on there with the Martells 
and the Danes and and things like that. So uh, that's the next one. And then I'm going to get on to what actually happened at the Tower of Joy. So I've not not left that series. We're gonna we're gonna finish that one off very soon. But I've just got a a few bits on Fire and Blood that um, hopefully you're enjoying, but I'm also really enjoying getting to. Um, uh, Miss M Dubs. Uh, question in the chat do you think there was an unrequited love triangle with Aegon and his sisters Visenya loved Aegon but Aegon loved Rhaenys but Rhaenys married for duty maybe even later defected yeah it was it was complicated so um what we know is that Visenya and Aegon married for duty that was what they thought they ought to do and then Aegon uh, married Rhaenys because he loved her. We don't hear about her um, feelings towards him. She she doesn't get much of a voice, actually. Out of the three of them, she's the, the biggest mystery, it has to be said. We hear a lot about Aegon. Visenya's character comes out a lot because she's the one who lived the longest. Uh, but Rhaenys we hear probably the least about. She seems to be the most free-spirited and um, uh, I think she probably did love him back, uh, but we, because, you know, she spent a lot of time with him, uh, but I don't think we know that for sure. Could she have later, as you say, defected? Um, it's entirely possible. I think that it's probably just as likely, though, that um, the hints in the book were that she had other lovers. Um, that seems to be quite a Targaryen thing. Uh, they were polyamorous um, in a very positive way they didn't see anything shameful in this this was just the way that they did things so um is it a love triangle i think triangle is probably slightly too simplistic for that i think that there is a lot going on we don't hear of the senior really um with her passionate love there yes for her son but beyond that um uh, and Aegon seemed to have just stuck to his two wives uh, Rhaenys probably was slightly freer and probably had other lovers. Uh, so that was the kind of situation. I don't think it fits into a neat triangle. I don't think many things that George R. R. Martin uh, writes about fit into sort of neat things. I think there's an element of love triangle, but also it's um, uh, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, we had some super chats. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, B1 Mary, uh, $10. That's very kind. Uh, just some love for all your hard work and effort. Thank you. That's uh, very much appreciated. And uh, uh, Kyle uh, Lachico um, uh, with $5. There's no question there that I can see, uh, but somebody out oh, just saying thanks for all your videos. Thank you very much. That's incredibly kind. Um, and then we've got Maura Lee. Thank you. Um, uh Maura, I've got your question that I will come to a, a little bit later, but $20, that's incredibly generous. Uh, Maura, you know how much I appreciate uh, all of your support. Thank you. Um, your, and I love it when people do this, picking up on other people's questions and bringing them to my attention, because uh, I always see the super chats because they come up nice and bright on my screen. Uh, but sometimes when there's a lot of uh, a lot of messages going on, then I can miss other things. Uh, but so Nicola, uh, Nicola Jurikin's question, something doesn't add up at the Tower of Joy battle. Do you agree? Well, I do agree. Um, let's, I'm just going to see whether I can find uh, Nicola's actual question or whether that was the, uh, the whole bit. Okay, I can't see it immediately. Uh, but in terms of something doesn't add up, Yes, I think a lot of things don't add up. What um, what doesn't quite work on many levels is the fight. Um, Ned, why did Ned only take the people that he took? Um, he didn't take that many. There, the, one of them, Howland Reed, was known not to be a great fighter one of them was just a squire um it was just uh, it it was quite an odd group of people that he took uh the placement of the tower of joy i've already talked about i found that quite an odd thing the the way that they show it on the show i do not think is how it actually happened in the books i 
uh, the Arthur Dane thing, uh, I think when Ned says he would have killed me but for Howland Reed, I do not think that means that Howland Reed killed Arthur Dane. I, I, that just does not fit Howland's character. I think that Howland intervened in the battle to stop it. And that's what I'm going to be coming into um, uh, in my Tower of Joy video is why. And one of the links to this, and this is the, the wonder of doing these kind of long series, is that you can actually start to try and draw out some of the threads from all these other things that we've got there. And and so uh, you, you probably know, I, I think it's entirely likely that actually Ashara Dane and Howland Reed were an item in some way. There's, I, if you've not come across that theory before, I know that sounds slightly, uh, slightly coming out of left field, but uh, I've worked through it. I've done a video on it, and I invite you to have a look at that. I think there's actually quite a lot of evidence for that. But if that's the case, um, then Howland and Arthur Dane were actually effectively brother brothers-in-law uh, and it just doesn't kind of hang together that he would just kill this person in a battle surely if howland even leaving that aside howland knew so much more because he had been hooked up to the weirwood network he went to the isle of faces he knew what was going on there's lots of evidence that he was prompting things that were going on all over the place um he knew what was going on with the big story why on earth would he let these people be killing each other? So, yes, I agree. There are lots of questions, but I think there are also some answers. We can't know things for sure because George R. R. Martin has deliberately um, kept all of this mysterious. That's that's something that he's uh, been very clear on all the way through. Even the, the de one description we have in the books is in a fever dream that Ned has and and... George R. R. Martin has told us straight out we shouldn't take that as literal fact. That's just a, a, a slightly fevered imagination from Ned. So there is some truth in there, but it's not actually literally what happened. So uh, anyone who tells you that they know exactly what happened, they don't. But I think that we can try and draw out what probably happened, or at least the outlines of it. So that's where I'm going to be going uh, with that series. Um, uh, I think we had, um, uh, 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 I, I think I did. Oh yes. Higa Herga. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just my usual cheer. Have a Merry Christmas and a Merry Christmas back to you. Um, yes, we've got, uh, it's only a couple of weeks away till Christmas now. So I haven't worked out exactly how that fits in with the live streams, but I will definitely be here, uh, next week and, and be willing, uh, wishing you all a very happy Christmas there. But, uh, but thank you for that. Um, it does actually give me an, an opportunity as I usually do just to take a quick pause to say the things that are going Going on because over on my second channel the well-told tale if you've not come across that before it is just me reading audiobooks it's long form uh, i pick what i consider to be the finest science fiction fantasy speculative fiction stories ever written and i just read them out one episode a week every wednesday um and it's about averaging about 45 minutes per episode at the moment uh although the one i did just this week turned out in to be about double that uh, at the moment just on the lead up to christmas which is where i got this link from uh, i am reading a christmas carol which is such an all-time classic but uh, i thought it's not too much of a stretch to call that uh, fantasy as there are four ghosts in it so i think that we can certainly put that one under the science fiction and fantasy uh, label but anyway so we're a couple of episodes into that if you're at all interested uh, the well-told tale there is a link down in the description to that i've already told you about things that are happening uh, coming up on this channel on in deep geek coming up uh, but uh, the only other thing I would just draw to your attention uh, is my Patreon uh, page. Uh, guys, a lot of you uh, in the chat are patrons. Thank you so much. I, I do say it every week. I mean it every week. I cannot carry on doing this without the support of my patrons. That's why I prioritize my patrons' questions on here. You, you'll you see week after week, if patrons ask me questions, if I possibly can, I will be answering those questions. And there are other benefits as well. Um, perhaps you just want to support the channel. Perhaps you want to get access to some of the uh, um, 
audio content that I do there. I do a few extra bonus readings for my patrons, which I put over there. Uh, but if you're at all interested, uh, there is a link to my Patreon uh, down in the description. Uh, but that's it. Um, let's get back to the questions. Um, and let's go with Joe Thompson. Um, again from Patreon. One of Tyrion's names in Essos is uh, Yolo. Is George saying something about you only live once about Tyrion or people being brought back to death? Um, and as a sort of a follow on to that, did Tyrion drown in the ruin? Is he risen harder and stronger? What is dead cannot die. So, the in terms of that last bit, for those who don't know, uh, so in the in the books, there's this scene when uh, he's going. Uh, he he falls into the water uh, in in the sorrows, and that's where. Uh, theoretically, you would think everybody says if you fall in the water there, then uh, you're going to get grayscale. But he doesn't seem to get grayscale. But the person who pulls him out just dips their hand into the water, grabs him and pulls him back up is John Connington. And he does get grayscale. So uh, the question that a few people have is either, well, first of all, why didn't Tyrion get grayscale? Does this mean that he's immune to it? Is this a hint he's secretly a Targaryen, perhaps? Um, and then, secondly, did he actually die at that point? Now, I don't think he actually died. I think that he, uh, the writing of that passage, I don't have it to hand, uh, but the implication is... Um, that, uh, yeah, he, he did sort of swallow some water and it wasn't good, uh, but he got brought back. And so it was a resuscitation in the same way that symbolically that's what the Ironborn do rather than a really bringing back from the dead. In terms of uh, one of his names being uh, Yolo, is this George trying to say something? I think... Um, uh, I, I think he probably wrote that before YOLO was a thing. Um, uh, I'm not 100% sure of the timing on that one, but um, I no, I don't think he's trying to send us a particular uh, message from that one, uh, I have to say. Uh, Maura Lee, thank you again. Another super chat. That's very kind. $25. Thank you. Uh, love listening to A Christmas Carol. Wishing you and everyone in the chat a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm really enjoying reading A Christmas Carol. I have to say it's a, it's a fantastic story. And it's um, it, it, there's a reason why all of these stories have survived. Uh, it's because they are just great tales. And the, the characters of people like Scrooge is just, um, it's brilliant. And it's, we, it's you all you don't need any more to explain the character of Scrooge because Scrooge, you know, being Scrooge like is now uh, a word in and of its own right. That's how um, uh, influential that book and, and those characters uh, have become. And it's it's wonderfully written and actually quite funny in places as well. I'd, I'd forgotten how funny uh, a writer that Charles Dickens could be. Uh, Susan Dunkel. Uh, I would like to hear your theory on Theon and the Whispering Weirwoods. Who is speaking to him through the trees and for what reason? Why do they want Stannis to bring him to the tree? Um, so this is in the books. And in the books, Theon, when he's being weak, he is in Winterfell and he hears the the weirwood say his name. This happens a couple of times. One time he sees the weirwood and thinks it has Bran's face. Uh, so we have that. That's the sort of the whispering trees thing. And then in the pre-released chapter from the Winds of Winter, the Theon chapter, we see him there. He's being captured by Stannis, who's at the time there camped outside Winterfell, hidden away in a crofter's village uh, with his army. And uh, Stannis is trying to work out what to do with Theon because 
to the northern lords who he's trying to get on his side. They're viewing Theon as this great betrayer of the Starks. It's his fault, and it is his fault, that uh, that the uh, that Winterfell uh, fell to the Boltons, and uh, so he's effectively decided that Theon should die, uh, because that's what the Northern Lords will want. And uh, we get uh, uh, Yara, Asher, in the books, uh, suggesting that he be killed in front of a weirwood tree, because that's the Northern Way. And then you get the ravens, who happen to be in this same room, uh, who have been interjecting all the way through the chapter. Uh, they... Uh, immediately pipe up saying uh, Theon take him to the tree to the tree and so we've got this link between Theon and the weirwood tree somehow so the question is what is going on there now I think it's pretty clear that the person speaking to Theon through the tree is Bran now there's a question of why Bran might be doing that, but um, first of all, I think it's just him trying things out, him actually just like working his way through the Weirwood network. He's hooked up uh, way north uh, of the wall in Blood Raven's cave, and he's trying things out. So there's that. But also, it's interesting if you look at those passages, what is happening there is that he is being reminded that he is Theon. At the time, it's, it, again, it's, it's a lot more uh, clear in the books than it uh, was on the show that his whole identity, his psychology has been changed. He does not believe he is Theon anymore. He's always uh, doing these little rhymes in his head about he's reek, he's reek rhymes with meek or whatever. He would just keep on doing that again and again and again, just reaffirming to himself of his new identity that he was not Theon. And so the effect, though, of having the weirwood tree, Bran through the weirwood tree, talking to him and saying Theon is to bring him back to an understanding of who he is as Theon Greyjoy. Now, I think that is important and quite critical to understanding what is going on here, because the bigger plot, there's a huge amount of stuff going on in Winterfell in the, in the books at this stage, but the bigger plot in terms of what Blood Raven is trying to do, Blood Raven is trying to get the North okay and sorted so that it can help try and defend um, against the, uh, the, uh, the others as they are going to be heading south. So he is trying to get uh, the whole Winterfell battle dealt with very quickly so that he can then move on uh, and, and try and, you know, he's trying to help supply them with the Dragonglass and all the rest of it. So I think this is part of what's going on there. Theon um, manages to, uh, to escape Winterfell himself, but he is also the, the one of the couple of people who can get the Greyjoys uh, on side and the Iron Islanders on side in the longer term. So, because uh, at the moment they're being taken by Euron to do whatever Euron wants, which is not going to be helpful to Blood Raven's cause. So, I think there's this whole thing going on here, reminding Theon of who he is. I think that there will it will come out soon that firstly the the person he escaped with was not actually, as everyone thought, Arya Stark, but actually this is Jane Poole. I think that's going to uh, come to the fore, added to which the fact that Theon actually didn't kill both um, Bran and Rickon, which is what all the Northerners think, that's going to come to the fore. So he's going to be saved from being killed in front of the Weirwood Tree. I think they're taking him to the Weirwood Tree so that we can have some of these revelations. And uh, then the idea is that he can go off and try and rally the Greyjoys, rally the Iron Islanders. So that's a kind of a long-term plot thing that's going on there. But this is Bran and the Weirwood Network influencing events, and Theon is central to it. Um, as 
uh, as a slight amendment uh, addendum to that you also asked who the man in the hooded cloak was this is quite a, a brief encounter theon has while he's still in winterfell with somebody who is a man in a hooded cloak he didn't know who he was wandering around looking very suspicious um and theon wonders whether that was the person who was killing uh, a few of the people in and around uh, winterfell um do I think this man secretly placed Ned's bones in the crypts? Well, I think his he is definitely part of one of the many plot lines which is going on in Winterfell, which is the Manderley plot line. The Manderleys have uh, got a grand plan to be uh, pulling together a northern alliance, and in order for that to be working properly, they need to be um, uh, getting Winterfell um in a less prepared frame uh, and so i think that there's a lot of secret messages going on with snowmen on the walls and all the rest of it uh working out who's on side and i think that that hooded man is probably one of the people who is a spy within the camp who is helping to communicate to people outside that's why he was suspicious of theon to start with because he was originally thinking that theon was the person who um uh, killed bran and rickon um we had a few uh, so i hope that one answered that uh, that that it's uh, it's a very complicated set of things going on up in winterfell in the uh in the books uh but i hope that's uh, that's quite clear um we had some super chats thank you guys uh curtis moore five dollars thank you uh new deep geek here <laughs> i love your vids thank you thank you for your passion and hard work judging by brand's look do you think Arya will use the dagger to kill him in season eight? Um, I think this is an interesting question because this is this is very much a show thing. So um, the the look there is that so we've got the dagger being the Valyrian steel dagger that uh, was originally uh, going to be used to kill Bran to start with. Um, and then it's found its way back up to a little finger, and then little finger gave it to Bran, and then Bran then gave it to Arya, saying it's wasted on a cripple. Um, in the show, I could certainly see the logic that it kind of makes some kind of sense that it was right at the very beginning. This was what was supposed to kill Bran. Right at the very end, this is what does kill Bran. I get that logic. I think that works quite nicely. The in in the books, certainly, I think that Bran is just going to be uploaded up into the Weirwood net in some way. But I don't think they're going to be able to show that as easily on the show. So it's possible that a shortcut to that is for him to be locked in some combat with the Night King and then Arya to kill him in a way to uh, get at the Night King. I could certainly see that. Um, but I... If I had to guess, the answer is no, but I understand why people might think that, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, Tammy Hutchins, uh, $31.13. Thank you. That is incredibly generous. Uh, thank you for being so wonderful, Robert. That is, I mean, that's a wonderful uh, uh, gift back. Uh, you are such a kind soul, and I always wish you beautiful blessings, especially during the holidays. Much love now and always, Tammy. Uh, P.S. My love and blessings to all of your viewers. So there you go, guys. Uh, Tammy is sending her love and blessings. Thank you, uh, Tammy. That is incredibly kind. Um, and we also had Steph Snow uh, saying, you look cute as a button in your striped jumper. It's a t-shirt, actually, uh, rather than a jumper. But thank you. Thanks for all your insight. Uh, wishing you merry holiday. And I can't wait to discuss season eight. Now, I'm, I'm really looking forward to discussing season eight. And uh, in particular, this is quite a long way in the future, but uh, I'm going to be at Con of Thrones in July next year. Uh, so I'm going to be coming out to Nashville. Uh, a lot of a whole load of content creators will definitely be there. Um, and this is going to be my first chance to meet the people that I've been talking with, interacting with, becoming friends with over the course of the last couple of years. And it's something I'm really looking forward to. So uh, as I say, it's a long way in the future, but if you are going to be at Con of Thrones, uh, it will be fantastic to meet you. And I'm going to definitely make sure that there's a way that I will uh, sort of sit myself in a coffee shop one afternoon and say, guys, just come and say hi, because uh, 
I see the names. I read what your your uh, questions are and things, and it'll be fantastic to meet you uh, personally. So uh, yeah, that's that's going to be my opportunity to just talk to everyone about season eight um, uh, afterwards. Uh, okay, let's go back to uh, some questions. Um, I said these were going to be random. They're going all over the place. I've been trying to get some sort of links here. This this is another brand question from 26 Art Girl. What if Bran goes into the Weirwood net, probably at the God's Eye, and finds out that he was the Stark that was being tied to the tree, being made the Night King? He would then be forced to kill himself for the good of all. This is a this is a theory that I, I know has been around for quite a while, that, that Bran is the Night King. And uh, that it sort of explains a lot of the connection that there seemed to be between the two of them. Um, I personally don't subscribe to it. I, I like the symmetry of it, but I think that um, this it's very much a show thing. I, it's it's quite easy to forget. We we do not have a Night King in the books, and we don't know huge amounts about the the others at all in the books now perhaps when the next book comes out we will get a whole lot uh, more information about the others i suspect george r. r martin's hinted that we're going to be going a little bit further north uh, so i suspect we'll get a little bit more there so maybe we will get some equivalent character of the night king my um uh, gut instinct is that the night king is is a character that has been created in part so that we can actually have a sort of a, a leader character for the others that allows us to sort of uh, have a focus for our attention there in the same way that they quite often have with say uh, the unsullied we could have just had a whole load of Unsullied, but there's there's Grey Worm, who has become a character who's uh, been a much bigger character in the show than in the books, um, because they need somebody to be the representative of the Unsullied. Similarly with the um, the Dothraki, they, rather than just having this whole mass, then they tried to create one or possibly two characters who would be sort of recurring characters so that we had characters that we could focus in on as being uh, representatives of them so i think that that's a part of that is going on there that's a sort of a slight digression away from the question i think that the night king this is show law we're working with at the moment the night king is clearly one of the first men and in my view the night king is very probably a stark now the if we go back to old Nan, she often like blurs in her mind between all the different brand Starks and they're all the same to her. I, I, I think that that is perhaps more likely that, that Bran in some way works his way up and down through some of the brands in history rather than gets himself into some kind of time loop where he was the night King and then meets himself later on i don't think that quite works and i think if the the night king um were bran he would know that he's bran so everything that we see him do now has to be in the light of the fact that he knows that he's that uh boy or young man uh, over there and he therefore would probably i think have a lot more interest in bran rather than John, who seems to be the character that he seems to be focusing on a whole lot more. So um, it's possible, and I'm not going to rule it out. I think it's the kind of thing that the show would probably do because it's it works well in a kind of a loopy thing. I don't think it's going to be like that in the books, personally. Kid28, thank you so much. $10, that's very kind. Just so, showing some love. Uh, you, by far, my favourite A Song of Ice and Fire content creator. Thank you. That's incredibly generous. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Lady of the Leaves. Um, 
asks uh, or doesn't this is not actually a question this is a comment more um just left on patreon but i think it was worth um uh, worth sharing saying i just want to comment on how compassionate george rr R. martin is when he writes about queen allison's multiple pregnancies uh, you say 14 i can't i didn't count but there were a lot um and uh, there were there were complications with a lot of them. Um, uh, some of them then uh, didn't go to full term. Some of them, the child would be born and die in, in infancy, and so on. It was it wasn't easy for her, um, and uh, so it's just uh, the, the the compassion. I think that this is one of the things that has come out. I think very strongly in Fire and Blood is uh, allowing people to be real people, and particularly the female characters. We get a lot more fleshed out female characters in fire and blood and although um uh archmaster gildane is uh i don't want to say misogynistic uh but it sometimes does appear that way he seems quite suspicious of quite a few of them let's put it that way um uh, anytime any woman ever seems to be clever or have artifice then he kind of hints that maybe she's a, a witch or a magic user or something like that um but the female characters are a lot more well-rounded uh, in uh, after fire and blood than they were beforehand and i think that is to george r. r martin's credit and i think that this is this shows us that he understands that um even in made up histories like this it is not history is not just um uh, the history of great men it is the history of all human beings who contribute to it so it's uh, i think this is one of the great strengths uh, and thank you for for that comment piano diva 11 do you think there would still be three heads of the dragon if visenya had been the one to bond with Beleriand? Basically, did it exist ahead of time, or is it something that Aegon I made up to sell his polygamy to the small folk? Um, so the the Valyrians did not have um, standards. They did not have sigils. So the Targaryens of old did not have a sigil. And there is no hint that I've seen that the three heads of the dragon is a thing that happened before um, those three Targaryens that we know about, Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya. It seems to have started with them, both as a sigil, a symbol, and a sort of like a, um, how to describe the three of them. So it seems to have started with them. It seems to have started uh, in particular when Aegon uh, first invaded and he it would appear he designed the sigil, the dragon with three heads. Um, and so that seems to have been a description of who he was, a figurative putting down of what the Targaryens symbolized in a way. So I think it started with him. Um, then you're saying, would it therefore have existed if Visenya had been the one to bond with Beleriand? Uh, no, uh, but I think what... So I don't think that that's relevant to this. I think that the interesting thing there is she was the eldest. So uh, does if she bonded with Beleriand, the biggest and oldest dragon would that have given her a greater claim to the throne that for me is a, a slightly more interesting question because the one of the many running threads through fire and blood is this whole idea of where women come into the succession should uh, should it be just down through the male line uh, should women inherit and uh, although we'd had hints of it previously, it becomes very apparent just reading through Fire and Blood quite how um, odd it is that we never actually had a Targaryen queen ruling in and out for her own right. Obviously, we did have one that got wiped from history six months during the Dra Dance of the Dragons, but that side lost, so 
um, uh, that conveniently gets written out. We had uh, we've had one um, when Jaehaerys was uh, was first king. He was too young, and so his mother was queen regent and effectively ruled in his stead. Um, but that doesn't seem to be to get counted. We're talking about Arya Targaryen. Pretty much her entire life, she was heir to the throne, and so, um, but for um, uh, accidents of fate, perhaps let's put it that way, she could well have been queen. So again and again and again, we see that the the female Targaryens were actually right at the heart of it, and so the idea that if Visenya had bonded with the larger dragon, would that have actually given her a claim? Uh, I, I think it's possible. Um, but was this something that uh, Aegon made up to sell his polygamy to the small folk? I don't think he thought about it like that. I think that he he just wanted to conquer and he came up with a sigil because he knew that they had sigils. And I think that the feeling for from the Targaryens was that they were different um, and they were just better and it was articulated specifically by Jaehaerys but I think even before that I think that the Targaryens just thought that they were better and didn't really have to sell stuff so much. Um, so I hope that one answers uh, that there. Um, Veronica uh, Dagon, a hundred dollars. Wow, thank you so much. That's amazing. Um, just showing my support for In Deep Geek. Found uh, found you through Grey Area. Been binge watching your YouTube and love every video. Thank. That is uh, wow. I'm, I'm incredibly touched. That's incredibly generous of you. Thank you so much. Um, I I love working with other YouTubers, collaborating with them. Um, it's one of the things that I. Uh, and committed to on this channel is always doing um, uh, giving other people the chance to um, have their perspectives on things. I don't think that I'm here with a monopoly on knowledge and insight on Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire. There are so many amazing people in this community, so I will always try and get other voices in on this channel as much as possible. And that's fantastic. If you found me through Grey, that's that's fantastic. I will give a plug back in return. Guys, if you've never checked out this Grey area, do go and do that. She does some fantastic videos. And actually, she was on here. I did a video with her, um, sort of a podcast style one, when we were talking through one of her theories, her theory being that Euron is the Valonqar. Um, that went up about three weeks ago, if you want to go and check that one out. But thank you, uh, Veronica, that's uh, incredibly generous. Bridget Boyle, I am curious to hear what you think about the dead Weirwood at Raven Tree Hall. Um, and guys, I'm, I'm starting to come towards the end of my questions from patrons so I, I will soon come to uh, any more questions in in the chat um but uh, bridget boyle i'm curious to hear what you think about the dead weirwood at raven tree hall and why so many ravens flock there each night if the tree is dead how does that affect the connection to the rest of the weirwoods seems to have some significance if all the ravens have the spirits of the children of the forest in them and the fact that the blackwoods are descendants of first men and also related to blood raven and so on yeah so um raven tree hall has for those who don't know it has a uh, a weirwood which is described as colossal this seems to be like the the biggest weirwood. We there are lots of different descriptors for for weirwoods, uh, but but colossal is the word that is used for it uh, for this one. But it is dead, and um, so the but the ravens uh, every uh, every sundown they gather there, and House Blackwood, whose house this is they are very important to the story um not so much just like in going to war and the blackwoods uh, being uh, important but they have they still follow the old gods they married into the stark family and also the targaryen family and so blood raven's mother was a blackwood and there's another blackwood um married into uh, the family as well uh through aegon the fifth i think it was and um so the the first men 
blood that is running through House Blackwood is very strong in all of the Targaryens we've got in the current generation. So that uh, that is the significance of House Blackwood. I think that the fact that there is just this big weirwood tree there is just to try and draw our attention to the fact that this isn't just one of those random houses somewhere that uh, in the Riverlands where they do follow the old gods. This is an important one. This is a biggie. Uh, we should therefore be paying attention to House Blackwood and what they're doing and what their significance is. So I think that's what's going on there. Um, the Ravens, uh, yeah, I think that there's um, there's clearly a link to the old magic again with Ravens, and I think that that is the... Um, uh, th the again a way of trying to show us to highlight the importance of house blackwood now i haven't got time to go into all of this 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 time but i think there's a very strong case for saying that blood raven was trying to deliberately through people like the woods witch the ghost of high heart and the like deliberately trying to do a little bit of genetic manipulation uh, eugenics if you like to try and make sure that the targaryen um bloodline retained that blackwood that first men bloodline in it as strongly as possible right up to the, the present day of a song of ice and fire so this i think these are just things george r, r. martin calling our attention to it as a complete aside um it's really interesting if you look at um a map of the areas where it's uh quite um uh old godsy if you like in the riverlands and you see that you can actually draw a kind of a line it's kind of a crescent line up through uh, you can start off at the neck um where obviously the cranig men are but then you can draw a line that goes down through um old stones which is a very magical place this is where jenny of old stones came from um uh, and then you can go down through Raven Tree Hall, and then you've got High Heart, where there are all of the chopped down weirwood trees, and then down to the God's Eye. So there is this clear kind of uh, crescent, as it were, of these uh, places where the old gods still rule, and the centre of that little crescent is Raven Tree Hall. It's a little bit of an aside. I don't know whether it's deliberate or not on George R. R. Martin's part, but it's. Um, uh, it, it's definitely there if you start looking for it. Um, I think I saw another uh, <laughs> smoke screen. Hi, good to see you. Uh, $10, just saying such a geek. Uh, great to see you. Uh, I actually, um, uh, while smoke screen's there, I did record another episode of, of my, this is an occasional series of, um uh, when i have another creator on and we just do podcast style and I ask the creator what's what's your favorite theory and then they set it out and then uh then we chat about it for a while i talked about when i had gray area on uh last week i recorded one with uh with chris smokescreen and he was talking through the the theory that he's got a a few videos i think on his uh, on his channel on um his, his me. I always always do spoilers for things that I'm going to be releasing in a few days' time. Uh, but but that's about the idea that the White Walkers are heading to the God's Eye. I was talking about it just a moment ago, and that the weirwoods must burn. So that is that's a theory that he's uh, explained a couple of times on his own channel, and we're we're talking through it in the video, which probably will come out. Uh, next week. Uh, I just need to do a little bit of editing on that one first because uh, uh, I coughed a little bit too much in it. I just need to clear that one out. But great to see you there, uh, Chris, and we'll sort out a few more things, I'm sure, um, uh, in in uh, in time. Um, just going on to Jared McKinnon. I think this was the last one uh, that I got from my patrons. Um Jared says, are you familiar with the theory that Kyburn was planted by Doran Martell? And if so, do you have any opinion on it? Um, uh, if not, what do you think Doran is up to and how serious of a player do you think he really is? Well, starting with Kyburn, I, um, I am sort of aware of it. Uh, and, and when I say I'm sort of aware of it, I'm 
I, I've seen people suggest it. What I've not yet come across is any actual evidence for it. Um, the, a lot of it seems to be based on the fact that Doran is clearly this um, political mastermind trying to undermine the Lannisters and bring the Targaryens uh, back into power. And Kyburn is a, a mysterious person who clearly has his own agenda, and we don't know where he came from originally because he's one of he was one of the maesters. And when you become a maester, you lose your surname. So uh, there, there are various. Um, uh, well, I, I, I won't try and explain the theory any more than that because as I say I haven't actually seen any evidence beyond that. So. I don't personally think, unless anyone can give me any convincing evidence otherwise, I don't think that he was planted there by Doran Martell for the simple reason that actually his story checks out as is. He uh, was kicked out of the, um, the Citadel for doing research that they didn't like him doing. This is research effectively into what lingers of life after death. And then he's a bit of a social climber and he got himself into a position where he could carry on that research. And that's exactly what he did. Now, I think that means that he's got an ulterior motive to what he's doing. I don't think that he is the ultra loyal to Cersei person that she seems to think that he is. He is using her. He is... Um, uh, making uh, the best use of he can as he can of the the money and the resources and the space and the access to um, to frankly uh, people and bodies to be experimenting on, um, and in return for that he is helping her out. I don't think that that means that he necessarily has to be a spy or a plant for somebody else. I think that he is a character in and of his own right, um, which kind of links uh, to, I saw it was a Q&A which appeared before we went uh, live actually from um, uh, L who uh, says, Kyburn versus Victor Frankenstein compare and contrast. I think this is a, a clear link across between the two of them. I think that uh, the difference is how they react. Frankenstein was one of the stories that I was reading on the Well-Told Tale, so it's still fresh in my mind. Um, the difference is how they react after they create uh, this uh, yeah, unlife or whatever you want to call it, their creature. Um, before that, they are both very much single-minded men of science trying to achieve a thing because they want to understand it. But then... Um, Afterwards, Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, he is appalled and runs off and doesn't really want anything to do with his creation after that. But we will see that Kyburn does. Kyburn then wants to use it, and he will, I am sure, want to create more. The Zombie Mountain is a, uh, a prototype. We often think of this as being like, wow, Kyburn's created this amazing thing, um, but he will see this as just the start. And I think the hint of that on the show was, if you remember, when he picked up the arm of the white and he stared at it, and you go, yep, that's the guy who's realized that there's more here that he can be doing. So um, it's a great analogy for the first part of it. The way that they differ is how they respond to what they created. Uh, incidentally, Maura Lee, uh, yes, I'm sorry, I say that I've, re I've reached the end of my patrons' questions. We had uh, we had one from you that I'm going to get to in just one moment as well, um, uh, which was linking across to Lord of the Rings, which I love, so I I'm looking forward to that one. Um, we had some super chats. Um, let's quickly see... Um, da -da 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 -da. So, uh, Les Versace... Uh, Probably I every single time I, I am uh, just uh, completely uh, um, get everybody's <laughs> pronunciation of everyone's name wrong. So apologies for that. Uh, Robert, why does Old Nan say all crows are liars? Well, this is um, is a saying. I think that there's 
there's a danger with old Nan of trying to take everything she says and does as being um, of some huge uh, truth. Um, there is a lot. She is the representation. I did a video on old Nan uh, a while ago. She is the representation of the oral tradition of the North. That means that she tells some stories which are probably very close to the truth. She tells some stories that are actually not at all true. She tells a story about how the um, in Bravos, if you remember, there's there's the Titan, there's the the, the that great figure um, uh, standing astride the the port of Bravos, and so, and she tells the the Stark children that that um, when Bravos gets attacked, that that comes to life and fights off whoever's attacking, and that's that's not true. She tells a story about um, a mist being ghosts, which doesn't seem to be true either. So some things she's just getting very wrong. Uh, some things she gets very right, obviously, and we focus in on those things. There's so there's a bit of confirmation bias going on with uh, with old Nan. It has to be said in in the books. Um, you're asking about uh, why she says all crows are liars. I think that's a um, that's a hint in here that uh, the 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 crow, uh, the three eyed crow, um, is not necessarily all that he seems. Now, this is uh, this is Blood Raven. This is the representative Blood Raven, and. Um, uh, the avatar effectively uh, and so I think that uh, what she is saying is that he is not that he's not just a crow he is a tree wizard and we mustn't forget that although we might think that uh, oh this is like saying that blood rave is liar he is he effectively he takes this small child and doesn't say uh, oh, you know what? I'm going to turn you into a tree wizard like me. I'm going to get you hooked up. I'm going to get you eating uh, all of this horrible, very suspicious looking red paste. I'm going to be doing all of these terrible things. I'm going to be teaching you to be um, how to inhabit the minds of creatures and people who don't perhaps want you to be there. He is a liar. Uh, and it's not, doesn't have to be anything more serious than that. But um, it's a saying from old man. It's just that that is the extra level that we're we're, we're dealing with here. But good question, um, uh, Victoria T. Your theory video. Oh, I just lost it. Scrolled past. Um, Victoria T. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, your theory video sparked my interest in Game of Thrones after years of resistance. Thanks and keep up the good work. You're yeah, you're very welcome. I I that. That means a lot. Thank you. It's uh, it's a fantastic uh, set of books, and so I'm I'm really pleased that I can just play a part in helping uh, you and and others uh, understand them and get enthused by them. Uh, that's that's very kind. Thank you, uh, Jared McKinnon. Uh, thank you so much. I think I've just uh, been answering one of your questions. Thanks for getting to my question. Uh, just want to remind all the people watching to hit the like button. Yes, uh, please do. That, thank you. That's that's very kind. Matt Stoker, ten dollars. Thank you. I just want to know what your day to day is like. How do you know so much, and how did you get there? Also, please answer my Targ question about dragon riding specifics found in the chat. You the best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, in terms of my day to day, how do I know so much, and how did I get there? Uh, I just read stuff. Um, I, is is the the honest answer? Um, you. When you get into this community and you you just uh, you discuss things with people, um, you can build up a huge bank of knowledge here. And what I said a bit earlier, I I, I honestly mean I am not um, the the sole reservoir of knowledge here. There are people who've been studying these books for years before uh, before most of us first picked them up. And there is such a wide amount of knowledge and information and understanding out there. Um, just just seeing in the chat, I saw LML was there earlier. Hi, LML. Good to see you. Smoke screen is around there. Um, there's probably been a whole load of other creators I haven't even spotted. Um, these guys have great perspectives. And, and uh, what I like to do is just to try and pull, draw all of these together and allow, allow you to uh, to 
pull from it what you want. Um, I come up with what I think is the most logical answers to, to these kinds of questions, uh, and then I present them to you. And frankly, if people come up with more evidence, better evidence, better ways of understanding things, then I'm very happy to uh, adapt my ideas. So uh, so that's that's how I operate. And please answer my target question about dragon riding specifics found in the chat. I will, uh, ooh, let's see whether I can find that. It's, uh, this is what I say is that it's, um, it's quite hard when uh, there are a lot of questions going on in, uh, in the chat that I quite often can't spot them all. Um, so, okay, I think this is the one saying, do you feel like George R. R. Martin is intentionally leaving out the specifics of how the Targaryens tamed and rode and bonded with their dragons? Do you think these specifics will come into play in the books? Sort of. Uh, he is he is keeping some things from us. I think that the the word that I would and you put it in inverted commas there, tamed. I don't think the dragons have ever been tamed, uh, which I think is probably what you're trying to hint at there. I think that the bonding with them does seem to be a thing which happens over a longer period of time normally. The, the characters we see who just like try and bond with the dragon and leap on its back straight away, they're the ones who are in trouble. They're the ones who it doesn't seem to work. The people who play the longer game, who feed them over time, um, Nettles is the obvious example here with Sheep Stealer feeding the dragon over a long period of time, gaining the trust. This is how it seems to be working, uh, is that you get that bond the same way that you would with any other creature. They're intelligent animals. It's not just some magic trick that's going on there. But the, the bit that um, uh, we're sort of missing in the books is how the old Valyrians controlled their dragons with um the we we hear about dragon horns so we've got dragon binder who um which is a a magical horn that is said to be able to control dragons that uh, is now heading over towards the dragons in the books so that's the bit that we're not sure about exactly how that is going to operate um but i don't think there's any huge mystery about uh, how the the Targaryens um, bonded with dragons. It's not written down in one sort of like clear guidebook, but it does certainly seem to be uh, a thing which is drawn out uh, over a number of different uh, incidents. It's, it is a matter of building up the trust as you would with any creature. Uh, so I hope that one answers that for you. Uh, LMC, uh, $10, thank you so much. I never really get why, in the current A Song of Ice and Fire story, the Martells are Targaryen supporters. Do you think it ties in with whatever was in Nymor's letter to Aegon? No, I think that uh, it doesn't come from there. I think that although the, um, the Martells and the Targaryens... Uh, had a time of peace then it didn't last long that was just the first dornish war that was stopped there were other ones afterwards so um it was quite a long time before the dornish actually came in to be part of the seven kingdoms no i think that this is a lot more to do with uh, what was going on and this is what i'm going to be coming to incidentally in my next videos the sort of the link videos just before we get to the tower of joy is quite how involved the Dornish and the Martells must have been in what was going on uh, around the time of Rhaegar. So Elia Martell was obviously married to Rhaegar. Lewin Martell was a member of the Kingsguard. So the, the Martells were intimately involved in what was going on at the time. They knew what was happening. Um, they weren't just this you know, completely oblivious to it all. And so um, the the Martells are Targaryen supporters, at least partly because they hate the Lannisters for what the Lannisters did, because the Lannisters were the ones who killed 
uh, Elia and her children, and partly because they've uh, they've got that familial bond now with the Targaryens, At, and it's um, it's quite easy to forget, but it's it's actually it's the same people. It's so we get Doran Martell was alive during Robert's Rebellion and all that's happened. It's not a thing which happened a few generations later. This is personal to him. This is something that matters to him because it was his close relatives who were there who were killed. So it's a personal matter for him. I don't think, yes, Doran Martell is playing politics, but I don't think it's about politics and power it's about a very personal um uh need for revenge and retribution and i think that we see obrin takes one approach to how to do that and we see it you see his passion and all the rest of it doran takes another approach they stay they share the same feeling but they try and deal with it in different ways um uh, Maura Lee, I said I would get onto your question. And it's Lord of the Rings one, which I love. George R. R. Martin got a lot of in, in he, oh, pardon me, got a lot of his inspiration from reading the Lord of the Rings uh, for his uh, series, for his books. Uh, so compare and contrast the magic and magical characters in both, including um uh, Blood Raven, uh, Saruman, the Night King, Children of the Forest, the Elves, etc. Now, um, I think this is a fantastic, I do just, before I'm going to answer that, just because I saw the super chat come up, Bernie, uh, I, aluminium wrapped ta Kraken taco. Uh, I, I hope that makes you happy. Um, uh, aluminium, yeah, so uh, you've spelt it aluminum, but it, clearly it's pronounced aluminium. Uh, and Kraken tacos, um, forever uh so uh, coming back to the lord of the rings links so george R. R. martin has been very clear that that he loves the lord of the rings he we often see it kind of presented that he's kind of like the anti lord of the rings that the lord of the rings is very um high fantasy and we've got clearly defined good and bad characters um and george R. R. martin's wanting to write a more complex uh, tale and i think all of those things are very true but he's also been very clear that everything that he writes and indeed everything that's written in fantasy fi fiction in second half of the 20th century or beginning of 21st century is written within the shadow of tolkien because he is so influential in the lord of the rings so everything that we've got going on here is uh, is in some way linked across now in terms of the uh, the, the things that you've drawn out here um the blood raven saruman compare and contrast i think is a fascinating one because um saruman although he wasn't the person that you thought he might have been to start with uh, he had a hidden agenda his hidden agenda was wanting power for himself blood raven personally i think his hidden agenda is actually not about wanting power for power's own sake he wants to use it in order to do what he thinks is the right thing so i think that they're slightly different characters blood raven uh, is george armand has got a few of these characters is the kind of person who thinks he's doing the right thing and doesn't mind doing bad things because he thinks that his overall aim is uh, so much higher and better Another example being Melisandre, of course. She thinks she's doing the right thing and she's quite happy to do a few uh, evil things in order to achieve her higher ends because she thinks she's saving uh, the planet. Blood Raven thinks he's saving the planet. Uh, they can't both be right, or can they? Uh, but um, that's where the, the difference there is that Saruman was wanting power for himself. The... Uh, the children of the forest the elves the others i find fascinating because the the elves uh, come very much from this kind of tradition of the the fairy folk or the the fae um and they are sort of ethereal and other and beautiful but also deadly and um so actually what you see here is that 
whereas the elves have uh, taken on a lot of that and Tolkien made them uh, quite pure and good, what you'll see is that actually the Children of the Forest and the others have both taken different aspects of that same kind of tradition that Tolkien himself was drawing on. So Tolkien didn't start all of this, of course. There's a whole fantastical fiction tradition before him. And so both of the Children of the Forest and the others come from that same tradition they're just taking slightly different elements and so i think that actually that's another hint that they are connected the two of them um so so that's what um where i would draw that one out and so it's almost like the elves have elements of them because they are linked to the same original idea the the, the fairy folk the 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 fae um that's uh that has come down to all of those different uh, elements in both lord of the rings and in um song of ice and fire you're also talking about the iron throne and the one ring uh whether the uh iron throne will have to be melted down destroyed like the one ring is um and you saying you like the idea of the creation of a new symbol for new leadership at the end of both the books and show like having a melting down the um the iron throne and turning it into a round table for sort of a more council style uh way of running the running the nation um so i think this this is a um something I've definitely heard other people talk about as well, but I think it's very clear point. The Iron Throne and the One Ring are very similar in the fact that they represent power. And the one of the morals of the Lord of the Rings, uh, Tolkien didn't like being moralistic. He wanted to be um, he didn't like allegory, he wanted applicability, which I think is something that George R. R. Martin has also picked up on. Um, but uh, it's very clear that getting rid of the object of power, the symbol of power, was an essential part of the plot of the Lord of the Rings, uh, because suddenly all the people who were desiring that thing, fighting over that thing, it wasn't there anymore. So they would have to figure out a new way afterwards, a new way of being. And it's the same kind of idea with the Iron Throne. It's a Game of Thrones. It's trying to, all these people struggling, fighting to win the Iron Throne. Um, and uh, this is, I've seen it played out actually over, I think over Twitter since the, um, the um, advertising a starter for season eight with this tag of for the throne um, and a lot of people coming out saying I don't think that's where this is heading I don't think yes we might have been starting out as a struggle but who's going to sit on the iron throne I don't think that's where this is really heading um, and I would agree I don't think it is oh pardon me um, so uh, does the iron throne have to be melted down I think it probably does I think it would make sense if in the same way Balerion the Black Dread uh, forged it, created it with uh, with its fire, I could see it being melted down by Drogon. Now, uh, the, the, those two dragons are clearly uh, comparable, the, the way that they're described, their colours, um, their temperaments, it's, there's a lot of echoing going on there. And incidentally, one of the things from Fire and Blood about where Danny's three eggs came from leaves open the intriguing possibility that perhaps actually Drogon came from the egg from Balerion. So actually they might be parent and child dragon, so to speak. Um, but yes, there's definitely a symmetry there and I could see Drogon melting it down. I love the idea more about the um, it being uh, turned into a different symbol. Uh, the idea of something like a round table for a new council uh, table. I, I think that's great. I don't know whether they will do that, but I think that's a, uh, that's a fantastic sort of answer to what actually happens with it. Um, I think I've uh, run out of... I've got one more question here I want to do before coming to the chat. So guys, uh, if you've got any more questions in the chat, uh, then 
Uh, now is the time for you to to drop them in. I will uh, come to them straight after this last question here. Uh, I'm going to round it up, I think, in about uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, so Vanessa Amnesty, I think this was a question again uh, from just before we went live, and I saw it, and I just uh, quickly cut and pasted it so I didn't forget it. But I think uh, I, 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 I really like the question. So the, it's what do you think about... George R. R. Martin's original Lion and the Rose script, where he points out that Stark's wolves will face Ramsay's dogs. Now, for those who don't know, there was a revelation just uh, recently. I, uh, I think I tweeted about it. I shared the link um, via Twitter uh, to it's the George R. R. Martin's original script, first draft script for an episode of Game of Thrones that he wrote. Uh, has been released now um i say it's been released i've just had this sudden thought that maybe it was uh, it's been leaked in some way i hope not because i try and avoid leaks but uh, I, I think it was all legit um but uh, he in case you don't know he wrote one episode of each of the first four seasons of game of thrones and after the first four seasons then he stopped and uh, since that's why seasons five onwards that's he's not really had as much of an involvement with but season four the the script that he did there uh, was for um the lion and the rose and the the bits that are intriguing there are the kind of little asides that he does uh, effectively little notes for the showrunners because the way it seemed to work was he would write the script then it would go to Dan and Dave, and then they would kind of tweak it, and they'd maybe uh, take a little bit out and put it into another episode, and then uh, cut out a bit that they didn't want, and stuff like that. So it started off with George R. R. Martin, and then got a tweaked and pruned down. Um, but there is one little aside here, where which is where this question is coming from, where he says, uh, when they mention Ramsay's hounds, his dogs, and George R. R. Martin says. Uh, make sure that you linger on the dogs so we know that Ramsey's got dogs because in a couple of seasons time uh, we'll be uh, having them face the uh, the Starks direwolves. Now I think this is absolutely fascinating because clearly this hasn't happened um, and in terms of direwolves that's also absolutely fascinating because at the moment the dire wolves are all in different places so the question is uh which wolves um and how i don't think that this is get this is going to be summer summer's going to be far is far north of the wall i don't think it's nymeria nymeria is wandering around the riverlands with a big pack of wolves and Aya is obviously off in bravos um ghost is potentially still around um, and of course we've got Shaggy Dog. And so I can only assume that the, the Stark direwolves that are being talked about are Shaggy Dog and um, uh, uh, Ghost. And that implies that they come up against the, uh, that uh, Ramsey comes up against the Starks. So presumably he survives the battle, which is clearly brewing in the books, um, the battle against uh, Stannis and uh, then he faces the stocks so that uh, that's there's a lot of sort of hints and possibles and things like that um but it's it's a fascinating little insight that that ramsey may survive a little bit longer in the books than perhaps we originally thought he might and the starks might come together again at least some of them in a way that um we do see on the show but perhaps a little bit earlier than that um, so those were all the questions I had from my uh, patrons. Um, let's have a quick look in the chat. I had another super chat. Downtown Clown Frown. Great name. Uh, $5. Thank you so much. Do you think the fact that Gilly's son being a half-brother to many of the others will become significant to the war for the dawn? Um, uh, yeah, this is a complicated so gilly's son uh should have been given to the others because this is one of craster's children 
um, but effectively got rescued by Sam and brought south of the wall. I, I think a lot of this depends on um, a couple of things that are currently quite unknowable. The first one is whether or not there's something special about Crasta. My guess actually is no. And when I say special, in terms of whether Crasta is magical in some way, um, and therefore it is his magical children that it, uh, allows it to allows them to become White Walkers. I think the answer to that personally is no. Um, uh, it's it's not anything special about him. It's just that he came to an agreement uh, with the others, tacit or otherwise. Um, so I don't think that's an issue. The other issue then is something that we simply do not know about is what do the uh, White Walkers know of their previous life or understand of their previous life. Clearly all of Craster's um, children, um, they were babies when they were taken, so they won't remember anyone else. I don't think that there's any hint that they would know that this was a, a somebody who was related to them. I don't, that's not a, sort of a magic that we've seen there. So my gut instinct is no. Certainly not on the show. I think that's a level of detail too far for them. I think they're cutting everything down uh, very uh, tight in that. In the books, then, yeah, I think it's possible that there might be some kind of uh, link across here. But um, exactly what it is, uh, I think, and I try not to say this very often, but it's it, we haven't been told enough information. George R. R. Martin has told us all next to nothing about the others. He's told us next to nothing about how they grow old, grow up, uh, what they remember of their previous lives, or anything like that. So we just do not know. The only kind of hint we have to that is that on the show that they they do that kind of spiral thing, which is showing that they remember the place of the their birth or where the children of the forest created them. So there is some sort of memory going on there. Um, but beyond that, George R. R. Martin has not given us enough information. Uh, but short answer, on the show, I don't think they'll have time to do it. In the books, it's possible, but we need to know a lot more about how the White Walkers operate. Um, uh, Kerry, uh, never saying you missed some super chats. Thank you for with the super chat, which is very kind. I will scroll back up. Um, uh, Maura Lee, fifty dollars. Maura, thank you. Uh, that's incredibly generous. Uh, thank you, Robert. Appreciate all the hard work and for providing these Q and A live streams for us to ask our questions and learn from you and each other in this great community. Yeah, guys, so uh, what I'm trying to do is that, yeah, I get on guests as much as I can, but I also try once a month or so just to have this chance where I just do it as an open Q&A because I know if I just have things on subjects, then then that's quite focused, but this allows any questions to, to happen. So I'm really enjoying this, uh, really enjoy doing these kinds of things. Um, uh, and yeah, I, can, I know there's a lot going on in, in the chat that I don't always see. Um, um and uh so yeah apologies if i i do miss anything i'm just quickly scrolling up now guys just to double check that i haven't missed any more super chats um uh i definitely got that one from bernie um and uh, uh andrew k uh here's one i don't think i spotted the time uh five dollars thank you uh, robert keep up the great work what do you think the significance of Egret flinching in the books and called Jon Snow an evil name? Um, so it's uh, this, I think it's just a little bit of um, uh, a reference to the winter and the cold uh, that uh, she is very clear that the winter and snow is the enemy and um uh, carrie nevers i just spotted your super chat there as well five dollars uh, for shared tolkien love <laughs> thank you um uh, but to get back to to this so we in the books 
to start with, we get these kind of hints from people like Old Man that winter's going to be terrible and they can bring death and all the rest of it. But but that's just still kind of vague and theoretical. It's only when John gets north of the wall that he actually starts to see that all of the harshness of the winter. And I think that uh, when uh, Egret is there and sort of like that's, you know, that's an evil name, it's because snow is treated with respect north of the wall because they know quite how horrific winters are and this is an important part of building up the narrative of a song of ice and fire is that uh, we see how fire dragons fire can be deadly but it actually we don't see until quite a bit later um towards the the last book then we we got a few more hints about how deadly uh, winter can be, how deadly ice can be, but we don't have huge amounts about it. And this is just another little hint being dropped in there that we need to treat both ice and fire as these, and this is quite thematic, but they are both these equal forces that could both destroy the world. And we shouldn't just view this as being the only real damage is from uh, the fire. Uh, it's also ice. So I think that's what was going on there. A little bit of kind of um, narrative work to try and draw out some of the, the bigger themes of what's going on. Uh, so I'm hoping that that is all of the super chats. Um, can't see any more. Um, I will answer a couple more. I'm going to just try and pull out a couple of random um questions from the chat uh, uh debbie dane uh, so if the sea lord of bravos had the dragon eggs did he take in danny and viserys in the hope of their eggs hatching that's a really interesting question um i think i think he took them in because at the time they were the recently exiled um effective rulers of westeros and the the sea lord will have probably been thinking well okay what do i do now uh can should i side with the the targaryens should i side with the uh the new rulers that are going on there bravos is a fiercely independent city-state it's it doesn't want to be uh reliant on anyone so uh, i certainly imagine when they came across the targaryens were also quite rich viserys um, uh, and uh, Danny, they used up a lot of their money, but they could certainly pay their way to start with. They could certainly be there as some bargaining chip in helping get Bravos uh, its money. Um, the it's very clear in Fire and Blood, if it wasn't already, th quite how strong the link is between the Iron Bank and the actual political leadership within Bravos. So I think they will be looking at how could they make the most out of what was going on um, in, uh, in Westeros. And I think they got kicked out probably because of change of political leadership, but uh, in uh, Bravos, but also partly because um, it was clear that the rebellion had, um, uh, turn from just being a rebellion and was now everything was settling down and it was strong and they were doing business with the iron bank and the iron bank was making money out of it so i think that actually the sudden the need to have the targaryens went away did he uh hope that the eggs would hatch um i i think that those eggs by that point had been in the family for a century and a half getting on for two centuries um and I think by that point, any hope that they had of the eggs hatching will have long gone. So that wasn't what was there. And I think taking it the next step along, I don't think that Illyrio gave them to Danny, thinking that she was going to hatch them. I think that they were just symbols of Targaryen power. Um, uh, Roland, uh, Sir Roland de Stark, uh, Robert, do you think that George R. R. Martin not giving us House Dane's words are a red herring? Or does it really have an impact on the story? I 
Um, I, I think we can't know until we know what the words are. Uh, I, I have a feeling they probably will have some symbolic value, um, but it, they could be something as simple, you know, we bring the dawn or something straightforward like that. But the, the, the role of House Dane is, yes, they were there, and in fire and blood you they're, they're mentioned a, a couple of times but not hugely um it's uh, they only really came to prominence during that period with Rhaegar and obviously they've got the sword um and I think that that sword will have a role and it is so that is what is going to be the importance of sword dawn uh that is going to be quite important because obviously dawn uh, if we're talking about the long night, what is the thing that ends the long night? Dawn. So I think that there's a, um, and, and it's the sword of the morning, um, and and so the the imagery is clearly there that they're going to be, or the sword is going to be, um, uh, at least is going to be very important uh, going forward. Uh, so. Do the words give stuff away? I suspect they probably do, which is probably why he hasn't um, uh, revealed to them. Um, but I don't think we know what that is until um, until we see them. Uh, okay, guys, I think I am going to uh, uh, end that one uh, right about there. There have been um, a lot of fantastic questions today and some incredibly generous super chats. Um, guys... I really appreciate uh, the super chats. Thank you for them. And and the questions uh, in the chat, where I got to a few a few of them, uh, my voice is starting to give out, which is why I'm going to have to stop now, I'm afraid. Uh, but I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Um, if you are at all interested in uh, supporting the channel, please do check out my Patreon page. Uh, there is a link down there uh, in the description. Actually, I see Chrissy Volstones has just popped one in the chat as well. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you to my moderators. Um, excellent work again. Um, uh, if you're interested in just supporting the channel or if you want to get access to some audio content that I do over there, so I, I've got the pre-release chapters from the Winds of Winter are over there. I've recorded them uh, and also uh, the one and I'm going to do another couple of the pre-release sections from Fire and Blood I've recorded there as well as having access to uh, all of the audio that I do for um, The Well Told Tale but guys uh, please do check out my Patreon uh, thank you so much I'll be back here next week for another one I think it's probably the last one before Christmas um, uh, thank you to everyone in the chat take care everyone and I shall see you soon